Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second AJAC Live Online webinar series. Whilst we're getting accustomed to our uh, housebound social isolation, AJAC looks and hopes to maintain contact and interaction with you during these testing times through our webinar series. So be on the lookout for future invitations and hopefully our next uh, webinar will be straight after PESA, so keep a lookout for that invitation. Now, before I get on to introducing our uh, distinguished speaker today, I wouldn't mind going through a few technical uh, issues and, uh, and, uh, um, and things to do inside the Zoom application. So first thing, you will notice that you're all on mute. Please continue to keep yourself on mute. Uh, and when you, or if you are asking a question, we will unmute you to ask that question. This will just alleviate any environmental noise that will impact on, on the presentation. The second feature that we'll be using inside Zoom is the hand, uh, the raised hands feature. And the way to access this is by clicking on the participant icon on the bottom of your screen on either your mobile device or your computer and laptop. Inside, once you click that participant icon, you will see a raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen as well. This will send a silent message to me that you were interested in asking Jonathan a question during the question and answers, and we will call upon you, unmute you to ask your question to Jonathan later on in the presentation. If you have any issues trying to raise your hand or you would like to ask a question, you can't find the feature, please don't hesitate to privately contact me through the chat feature inside Zoom and we'll try and work it out through there as well. Now on to our distinguished speaker. Thank you so much for making the time for us today, Jonathan. Dr. Jonathan Shanza is the Senior Vice President for Research at the Washington-based Foundation for the Defense of Democracy. He's a former ter terrorism finance analyst at the US Department of Treasury, as well as working for other Washington-based think tanks, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy and the Middle East Forum. Jonathan's expertise uh, spread right across the uh, Middle East region. However, today his topic is Iranian imperialism under the cover of COVID-19. So before we hand over to Jonathan, I'll hand over to Executive Director of AJAC, Dr. Colin Rubenstein, to say a few words. Thanks, Joel, and thanks to you and your colleagues, uh, particularly Ariel and Naomi, for setting this up for our second webinar. Uh, it's AJAC continuing to do our information work. Uh, in, in this case, uh, bringing to you outstanding speakers to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We also have our regular work, our review, just out, the current Australia-Israel review, April, very up, up to date with its analysis of what's going on. It should be in your letterbox or your email box uh, right now. So, Jonathan, thank you very much for um, agreeing to speak to us today. Jonathan is an outstanding analyst on the Middle East at uh, a very heavyweight think tank in Washington that really punches uh, above its weight, that uh, got a powerful punch in Washington, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, uh, developed un under the leadership of Cliff May. Uh, many of its uh, outstanding analysts are familiar to us in Australia and have been guests of AJAC, as Jonathan has been in recent years. We're at a turning point in global affairs, it, it, it would seem. And today we're looking at whether former conflicts uh, might lessen uh, going forward, uh, whether they'll perhaps remain the same or whether they'll mutate and become even worse. And of course, two of the major culprits on the international stage that one has to be somewhat circumspect about are obviously China, whose role in uh, the coronavirus is under great scrutiny, uh, is being dealt with a lot of skepticism and generating a lot of concern and review in terms of countries' relationships with China. But today we turn to another uh, state, a rogue state in Iran, uh, a revolutionary, reactionary Islamist uh, dictatorship. And uh, it throws up many issues. It's making it very clear in, in some ways that it's concerned about the survival of uh, the current regime rather than the welfare of the Iranian people, who are clearly suffering greatly and very hardly hit by this coronavirus. It's leading to all sorts of issues being raised. Uh, as to whether the regime's uh, uh, continued sort of lies and neglect will lead to growing unrest at home. On the other hand, a lot of talking points about the need to ease sanctions against Iran so the humanitarian aspects of dealing with that problem can be set in train, or whether indeed uh, humanitarian assistance and medical supplies are available in a way the regime does not avail itself of. 
Uh, President Trump in the last 24 hours is threatening, warning Iran uh, not to use its proxies in attack on Americans, particularly in Iraq, and that if it does, it will pay a heavy price. And Israel, of course, uh, also very wary of Iran activating its proxies, be it Hezbollah or Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. There are these and so many other questions, and we're very privileged today to have Jonathan Chanza to address these and many other questions in the present presentation that's going to follow. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Colin, uh, and thank you, Joel. Really wonderful to see you guys. Uh, I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. I know we're all going through a bit of a trying time. Uh, let's just hope that within a few weeks or maybe, God forbid, a few months, we'll get past this. Uh, it's, I know, tough down there. It's, it's tough here as well. Um, I want to also just commend you for keeping, uh, keeping on business as usual. Uh, we're trying to do the same thing at FDD. I know it's not an easy thing to do, but it is incredibly important to remain in touch uh, with, your, with your supporters and, uh, and with those that follow your work. So I'm very pleased to be able to help out in that regard today. Um, I, I, you know, coming to, uh, to speak with you today, it, it dawned on me that uh, I uh, was in Australia giving talks for AJAC. This was February of 2018. And it was at that time uh, that uh, right actually as I was flying uh, from Washington to Australia, there was a military skirmish on the border between uh, Israel and Syria. Uh, at that time, there was a drone that was flown in to Israeli airspace. The Israelis shot it down and then carried out an attack against the T-4 airbase. Uh, in Syria, it would, was probably one of the more serious skirmishes between uh, Israel and the Iranian Axis to date. And uh, it's a good jumping off point for actually where we are right now. Uh, a bit of background leading up to this moment. Of course, we know that uh, there was the very deeply flawed 2015 nuclear deal. This was a deal that President Donald Trump decided that he was no longer going to abide by rather early on in, in his administration. He pulled out and began to reimpose sanctions on Iran. Now, of course, Iran had gained significant amounts of money as a result of that 2015 deal, uh, more than $150 billion worth of uh, sanctions relief. And much of that was spent uh, not on uh, rebuilding its society, not on ensuring that it's people who had been impacted by sanctions by, in one way or another, uh, they were not helped. Uh, what happened was, is in fact, the Iranians decided to spend that money on its proxy network. That there are uh, about uh, two dozen different Shiite militias uh, scattered across Syria and Iraq uh, that Iran has sponsored over the years. We have the Houthis in Yemen. Uh, you've got Hezbollah in Lebanon. You've got obviously uh, Hamas and uh, the Islamic Jihad uh, in the Palestinian territories. And these proxies were really, I think, the way that uh, the Iranians decided that they were going to try to expand power. And we've talked about this before. I'm sure you've heard of the, the concept of the Shiite crescent. What Iran realized that it could do uh, after, being, uh, after enjoying the cash injection that it got from the international community, uh, and certainly watching also the international community deciding that Middle Eastern wars were not worth it, that they were too painful, that they were too costly, we were all leaving the Middle East. This meant that Iran could fill the vacuum. And what they did is they built uh, what they're calling the Shiite Crescent, a, a territory that stretches from across Yemen uh, into the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, uh, up through uh, Iraq and Syria, all the way to Lebanon. And the idea was, was that Iran did not need to have a direct presence there at all, but rather it could uh, exert power by proxy, by weaker forces that were just armed and funded and trained by Iran. Now, this has been the strategy of Iran for the last several years. Uh, that, um, uh, that Shiite crescent has grown stronger. Uh, it is basically an almost connected uh, network of highways and byways, uh, as well as aircraft uh, that have been able to bring those weapons and fighters to the places that are needed in order to exert control. Uh, they took advantage of the vacuum that was created by the fight against ISIS 
But this network of proxies was really Iran's uh, greatest feat. Uh, and then around, uh, roughly around the time that we, uh, uh, where I was speaking to AJAC in 2018, we began to see something a bit different um, or, or a new wrinkle in Iran's strategy. And back then the Israelis started bombing things in the middle of the night and did not take credit for it. <clears throat> Most of the time there would be something that would explode on the tarmac of uh, the Damascus airport or in places, uh, remote places in Iraq or even occasionally in, in Lebanon itself. Now the Israelis early on were very cagey about what was happening. They were saying that, uh, well, if it were the Israelis, and they're not saying that it was, but if the Israelis were to have attacked, it would have been because they were game-changing weapons. This is the term that they used, game-changing weapons, a very euphemistic term for the weaponry that they were targeting. What we have learned over time is that the Israelis have carried out probably at this point more than 500 different strikes on different assets that were being moved around the region, um, uh, 500 different uh, operations with more than a thousand different targets, things that have exploded. And what we've learned is that they're not just game-changing weapons as the Israelis describe them, it's much more specific than that. It is uh, precision-guided munitions. Uh, we call them PGMs. This is the acronym that we use, and I will tell you that that acronym is an acronym that everybody should get used to hearing because I believe that the year 2020 will be the year of the PGM. Now, let me explain to you what it is about the PGM that has the Israelis so concerned. Uh, if you look at Iran's strategy up until now, over the last decade or more, uh, they have armed their proxies with, let's just call them dumb rockets, unguided rockets. What they do is they, uh, they face them in a general direction of Israel and they fire them, they go up in the air and then they come down. And most of the time they actually don't hit their targets. One reason is because they fall short. Uh, that uh, the, the way that they were aimed uh, was not successful. The engineers behind it were, uh, were failing at their jobs. The other reason why they would not uh, land on their intended target is because they would go too far that they would overshoot their targets, they would overshoot the Israeli communities, and they would go into the Negev desert and explode there. Um, and then the other reason why they were unsuccessful is because of the Israeli ingenuity, uh, this amazing defense system known as Iron Dome. Everyone is, of course, familiar with Iron Dome, but what Iron Dome does is it assesses the trajectory of these dumb rockets. It gets a sense of where an unguided rocket has come from, how far up in the air it's going to go based on the speed and the angle that it was fired. And then once it hits its peak, the Israelis are able to very quickly determine whether it is going to land on a strategic target inside Israel. So that could be a civilian target, a mili military target. And if they determine that it is headed for something that they don't want them to hit, that's when they fire off an interceptor from Iron Dome. It explodes midair. It's unbelievable technology. And the Israelis have had a 90 to 95% success rate in derailing these rockets. Now, the Iranians, of course, are not happy about this, nor are they happy about the fact that the US bases that they would like to target have similar technology, uh, that the Saudis or the Emiratis have been potentially able to knock those uh, dumb rockets down if they're fired from Yemen or from Iraq or from other places. And so what they have done is they have launched a campaign to turn their dumb rockets into smart ones. Uh, the idea here is that there are two different ways that they can create these rockets. One is, and I'll just use this highlighter for just an example, but you think about this, think about this as a rocket. What they will do is they will attach fins at the bottom, four of them, and this will allow them to be able to guide the rocket in one way or another. Then what they'll do also is pull off the top of the rocket, the cone. They'll drop in some circuitry, they'll drop in some software, and, uh, and then what they'll do is uh, connect that to the explosive. Uh, they'll add a GPS um, uh, kit on the top of the rocket or even a, some kind of, a, of an eye. And then what they'll do is they'll put it back on, they'll solder it back up, and then for about the cost of $15,000, this dumb rocket becomes a smart one, and it will be able to hit within five to 10 meters of its intended target. That is very, very different than what the Iranians have been using in the past. 
Now, in addition to that, the Iranians have also been trying to build indigenous PGMs, precision guided munitions, in facilities in places like Lebanon and Syria and Iraq. They have, um, uh, they have full production facilities, often that are underground. And the idea is to build them not uh, in a retrofit way, but to build them from scratch, indigenous uh, uh, weaponry. And uh, as we understand it right now, these rockets have been destroyed by the Israelis in large part. These attacks that have been happening in the middle of the night, the Israelis have been successful. They have what we call intelligence dominance. They are able to see where Hezbollah and the Houthis and the various Shiite militias have been building these rockets when, uh, when they're shipping parts by way of truck or by airplane, um, or when engineers have trained in Iran and they're coming back to places like Syria or Iraq or Lebanon, they are knocked out. And the Israelis have been terrific about that. The problem is, is that even if they have incredible dominance, which they do, there is still going to be a small percentage that leak through. And this is what is happening right now. We believe, according to assessments that I've heard from Israelis, that uh, Hezbollah in particular has somewhere in the range of um, three dozen to 300 of these PGMs. Now, why are they dangerous at this moment? Well, for two reasons. One is uh, if they fire them at an Israeli target, it's actually quite possible that uh, these PGMs would be able to engage in evasive measures and dodge Iron Dome and then ev eventually hit their target. Or the other thing that they could do is they could fire 21 PGMs at a given target. Why 21? Because there are 20 interceptors in Iron Dome, which means that if you fire enough precision weapons at one target, like for example, the chemical weapons, or the, rather the chemical plant in Haifa, uh, the nuclear plant, alleged nuclear facility in Dimona, or the Kiria, uh, which is the sort of Pentagon of, uh, uh, in Tel Aviv, what you could have is the equivalent of a chemical weapons attack, or a nuclear attack, or a mass casualty military attack, that would ultimately do grave damage to the Israelis. Now, the Israelis continue to, to try to strike wherever they can, but we know that even two nights ago, there was a strike in Syria of parts that were destined for a PGM factory, and the Israelis destroyed it. Now, why is this important now? Number one, we know that Iran is under a lot of stress. Colin mentioned this up front. They are losing money. They are under a huge amount of sanctions pressure from the United States. And what they are doing right now is they are crying foul. They're saying that it is the sanctions that have been imposed on them by the United States and the international community that is preventing them from tackling the COVID crisis, that they have a medical emergency that is emerging within that country. And yet at the same time, they are sending these parts and these rockets to other places, far flung places in the Middle East. I mentioned even the retrofit kits cost $15,000 a piece. The factories themselves will cost millions and the Iranians are still spending money on those even as they deal with their crisis at home. Now the Iranians right now, it's very clear to us that what they're trying to do is they're trying to finish a project that was started by Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani, everybody recalls, this is the Iranian general that was liquidated by an American airstrike. And it was interesting, the, when, when the United States responded to, uh, to Qasem Soleimani's aggression, what they were actually responding to uh, were attacks that were taking place by these same Shiite militias that Iran has been funding uh, over the years. And when Donald Trump threatens that he will take out uh, Iranian assets, he is talking again about those same Shiite militias. Qasem Soleimani, this was exactly what he built. What they're trying to do right now is to finish the job. They want to complete the Shiite Crescent. They want to complete the PGM project. So what they can do is surround Israel and also surround American bases. They want to surround, uh, they actually want to try to take over much of Lebanon. And they're crying foul uh, about sanctions even as they do this. So this is a very weak link in the argument that Iran has been making, but nevertheless, the spokespeople for the regime, the people that have been apologists for the regime, continue here in Washington, I'm sure in Canberra also, and all around the world are trying to convince the world that it is time to come together and to provide the COVID support that all these nations need. But what we know is that the Iranians continue to divert their funds 
in order to build a hegemonic empire. Their goal is to, dis to establish dominance across the region so that they could attack American bases, so that they could attack American interests, so that they could attack uh, Saudi oil facilities, which they did with PGMs last year. But more importantly, their goal right now is to surround the Israelis with PGMs so that they could turn Jerusalem and Tel Aviv into the equivalent of Seoul, much in the same way that Pyongyang has done uh, with its southern neighbor. This is the aim of the Iranians. This is why sanctions relief cannot be granted so long as this is happening. Now, I'm gonna just end with one other quick thought. Um, all of this is also happening at another interesting moment in the Middle East. Uh, there is a crisis that is looming just north of Israel's border. In Lebanon, the, uh, the government there has just defaulted on its first euro bond, more than a billion dollars it owes the Europeans, and they are unable to repay it. There are another four billion or so dollars coming due in bonds that the Lebanese have also said they cannot repay. They are also crying right now, telling everyone that they need assistance for COVID that they need bailouts, that they cannot do this themselves, and it's the wrong time for the international community to blame them for the fact that Hezbollah has taken over the country through corruption and with the military assets that they have. So there is a moment right now where the Israelis have floated this with the United States as well as with the Europeans, that if uh, the Lebanese government is somehow able to prevail upon Hezbollah, and the Lebanese armed forces to remove these PGMs from, uh, from Lebanon and to reduce the threat that Israel faces, again, that could be the equivalent of a, of a nuclear or chemical attack, that there could be a deal to be made, and it could actually spark a discussion about trying to remove Iranian influence from Lebanon. And if that were to happen, there is the possibility of trying to do that in other places where Iran has gained a stranglehold, like in Iraq. These are places that are not entire, entirely lost. Unfortunately, they're probably 90% lost, and this could be the last moment that they have to save their countries before Israel has to take more drastic measures, or whether these countries just implode on their own economically. So we're at a very tenuous moment in the Middle East, but I can tell you that much of the tension right now, at least militarily speaking, stems from this uh, PGM problem. This has been Iran's goal as it has been under sanctions, and it has, as it has been crying foul all these months and years. What they're saying right now is, uh, you know, you've got to bail us out, you've got to bail us out, but instead what they've been doing is, spent, is spending tens of millions of dollars producing very deadly weapons that are coming close to being used in the Middle East. So I, I've gone on here for about 20 minutes or so, uh, I think that about sums up where I'm coming from. I'm very happy to take any questions that you have about things that are happening here in Washington. If there are elements of the Iran challenge that you'd also like me to tackle, I'm happy to do so. Uh, but I did want to lay out this PGM challenge as my, prim as my primary point for the evening. Thank you, Jonathan, for that. Uh, much appreciated. Now, just to remind uh, those who wish to ask a question, the feature that we're using is called raise hand. You can see that at the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a little icon saying participants. If you click that, you will have the option of being able to raise your hand. Uh, and that will give me an indication as uh, to who would like to ask a question. So I'm gonna go to, uh, I'm gonna go to Spee Fleischer to ask the first question. Uh, Spee, away to you. Hi, Jonathan. Um, how are you? Um, I just want to ask, uh, Joe Biden, the, uh, the Democratic presidential candidate, is, uh, has talked about possibly lifting sanctions today, and there's some push by others in the Democratic Party to do so on Iran. Um, is there, what would be the effect on Iran policy in the US if, uh, if Biden were to win the presidential election? What would change? I think that's uh, it's a good question, and, and good to see you. Um, what I would say is that um, we are concerned about these statements. Uh, it's not clear that this would be a full cave on all of the sanctions involved, but of course, uh, Vice President Biden was involved in the construction of the original nuclear deal, and there are at least a few of his, uh, what I think would be some of his advisors, that are very much eager uh, to get back into the deal. 
the good news is, is that there is a debate within the Biden camp. Uh, from what we understand right now, there are those who would like to go back to where they were, and there are others who re realize that we cannot just simply uh, hand over additional sanctions relief to Iran this, this deep into the deal. In other words, going back to where we came from makes very little sense. We have the end of the arms embargo coming in October, which is extremely dangerous. And by the way, this PGM issue highlights exactly the problem. If they're given a green light to do whatever they wish in terms of buying and selling arms on the open market, you could see more of this technology being handed off to the wrong people. And this is a point that I think is not lost on some of the vice president's advisors. And then of course, after that, you've got the ballistic missile embargo that's coming due in just a few years. And then the sunset provisions that come due after that, and that's in five or six years. So what you have is I think a realization right now um, that there is um, uh, maybe a, a different deal that needs to be struck, that there needs to be some uh, third way that if in fact the vice president wins, it cannot be what it once was, even if they don't want what Donald Trump has put into place. And our goal, quite frankly, is to be able to work with this new administration, if there is one, to ensure that they think through all of the problems and don't give Iran a complete green light. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Senator Fawcett. Terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, Jonathan, just interested in your view on what the true situation is in Iran in terms of their capacity to cope with coronavirus there, COVID-19, and the impact on A, the population's trust in the government, i.e. the stability of the regime, uh, but also that combined pressure on their support for Assad, uh, just given the situation in Syria, refugees going through Turkey, impact on Europe, which is itself in crisis at the moment with COVID-19. Do you have any views on what the cumulative effect is of COVID-19 on those two aspects? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question. Thank you for raising it. Um, look, what I would say is that, number one, there is a huge loss of trust uh, among Iranians with their regime. There is a, a, an understanding right now that there is just um, uh, that they're dealing with a regime that is utterly consumed with its own survival, that they are spending money on things abroad um, and, and their foreign legions as opposed to handling their crises at home. And, and by the way, this came long before the, uh, the COVID crisis uh, when we saw the, the uh, liquidation of Qasem Soleimani and then the subsequent downing uh, of, a, uh, of a passenger jet plane. Uh, you know, you saw people coming out into the streets. And by the way, you'd seen people coming out into the streets long before that, uh, complaining about how the Iranian regime was, was uh, more concerned about what was going on in Gaza or Yemen than they were about what was happening in, in, in their own country. And so the frustration continues to boil over. Of course, uh, you're not gonna see a lot of public protests because of uh, the concerns about being six feet from other people but uh, we do get a sense that the frustration continues to mount and the legitimacy of the, of the regime continues to erode. Um, I do think that there's an interesting story that will come out of Syria, and Syria is not the only one, by the way. There are a number of, uh, of territories right now that are undergoing civil war, as we know, in the region, uh, Yemen being another, uh, Libya being another one as well, where there is virtually no public health to speak of. Uh, the public health protocols are almost impossible to put into place. If you look at the numbers of uh, COVID cases being reported, it is, uh, I mean, they're basically saying that there aren't any um, or that there are only a handful. And of course, we know that that is impossible. Uh, and so it is quite likely that you will see thousands upon thousands of cases being reported in, in, in these jurisdictions. And you also have to remember that these are lawless areas, uh, a huge amount of human migration. And they are going to be on their way to through Turkey uh, into Europe uh, or to other places in the Middle East. And so there is going to be a huge, huge problem uh, that I think results from, uh, uh, from, from these wars. And I don't think that, uh, so in other words, even after the West is done battling the COVID crisis or even, um, you know, African states that have controls over their own borders, you're still going to see COVID uh, swirling around as a result of these war-torn countries. This is a price that I think we're all going to pay as a result. Um, a few other territories that I would just note, 
uh, that we're watching. It's actually really interesting to watch. Israel is doing a lot of coordination with the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, trying to do everything they can to contain the COVID crisis in these territories, uh, not because they have such a, a particular fondness for the leadership in either territory, but because they're trying to uh, keep the, the, the region safe. Um, and uh, they also understand that there's a weak central authority in both regions, so they need to help out where they can. Um, it's unclear exactly what the numbers look like in Gaza. We've seen a couple of, uh, of, of reports up until now. But it's these areas of weak central authority that are going to be important to watch as we finally get a handle on it in, uh, in first and second world nations. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, over to Ida Lichter. I don't, are you there? Hello. Hi, we can hear you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Shanta. Um, I have two questions. What is the current status of protest movements in Iran, particularly the women? And secondly, why is Europe generally unwilling to admit the danger Iran poses to regional and world peace? Uh, good questions, both. Of course, um, you know, we, we did see quite a bit more uh, in terms of uh, protest activity coming out of Iran uh, before the COVID crisis. Now it's gotten a, but a bit more murky for reasons that I've already discussed. Uh, women were playing a significant role, uh, as were youth, as were even older people. I mean, we saw broad participation in these, uh, in these protests. And uh, the hope, of course, is that uh, the pressure will continue uh, long after the COVID crisis is over. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of frustration on the part of the average Iranians because of the choices that the regime has made and the way that they've been spending money. Again, I do believe that the PGM issue that I talked about this evening, it's not lost on what's happening in, in, the, uh, in Iran. I believe that the people there understand, they may not know exactly that it's precision guided munitions, but they understand that right now the Iranian regime continues to spend a lot of money um, uh, uh, with its Shiite militias and, and with its proxies. And by the way, I should just note that um, it's interesting to see that the spread of COVID-19 in some cases has actually come through Iran, um, that we have seen IRGC spreading COVID in places like Iraq and Lebanon, because uh, in Lebanon, for example, the flights uh, with the weapons parts and, and the fighters were coming in from Iran long after the Lebanese started closing the doors of their schools. And so there is a clear sense right now that even as there was a public health crisis brewing, uh, that there were, um, that the Iranians were ignoring it and uh, focusing instead on uh, their military aims. So uh, we hope to see, uh, for the sake of the Iranian people, uh, the resumption uh, of these protests and, uh, uh, and to see more uh, in terms of social media and other activism, even while people are in lockdown, and let's hope they are in lockdown now for the sake of their own health. Um, the European issue, it's an interesting one. Um, I've had a lot of conversations with, uh, with European leaders uh, in, in recent months, had some fascinating conversations with the Dutch as well as the Brits, um, and they are still wedded to, uh, to the idea of trying to salvage the deal or save it. I think, though, that there is a realization that they can't go back to the uh, structure that was put in place in 2015, that too much has changed, uh, and that there are new issues that we need to deal with. For example, uh, the Israelis had that daring raid on the warehouse uh, in, uh, in the outskirts of Tehran, where they were able to spirit away a number of, uh, I mean, actually hundreds of thousands of documents. Uh, that were uh, bit clearly indicative of the fact that Iran had a military program, which was something that the Iranians would not admit throughout the entire JCPOA negotiations process. And so that is now something that the IAEA is dealing with, and they are trying to get uh, answers out of Iran. Of course, there is a problem right now, and that is that COVID has actually prevented the IAEA from deploying its inspectors to Iran because they don't want to be exposed. So uh, they're, you know, instead they're talking about doing it by uh, camera, by video, and that of course will not get to the bottom of any of these tough questions uh, that the Israelis have posed 
But nevertheless, I do believe that the, uh, the Europeans understand this. But if you really want to understand why the Europeans are so stubborn about this, what happened was is when the president here, President Trump, uh, threatened to leave the nuclear deal, um, what he did is he gave the Europeans an opportunity to try to salvage it. He said, look, here are our biggest problems. Here are the concerns that we have, all very legitimate, by the way. Um, all of the fatal flaws that uh, we at FTD and elsewhere, uh, you know, others had been uh, talking about the very challenges of the, the, uh, the, the timeline of the deal, the fact that it didn't deal with some of the military dimensions, all of the issues that I'm sure everybody on this call uh, is aware of. Um, and what we understand from the Brits in particular is that they were, uh, that they had tackled, there were five issues that they needed to tackle. Four of them were settled, one of them was not, and, uh, and Trump's deadline came and went. And that's when Donald Trump pulled the plug on continuing to negotiate for a revised deal. And the Europeans felt that they had, uh, they had it within their grasp, that they were almost there. I'm not sure that they were. I believe that Iran was still stonewalling and still lying. Uh, and by the way, still carrying out this PGM program, still funding its militias. The problem with the deal always was that it was myopic in nature. It dealt really only, only primarily with the nuclear issues and didn't deal with Iran's other uh, malign behavior and aggressive behavior around the region. And I think that the Europeans still believe that they could talk the Iranians out of those behaviors as long as they're able to keep the nuclear deal in check. I think it's wrong. Uh, they think otherwise. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, over to Jeremy Samuel. Uh, thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, I wonder, I mean, you touched on the protests, but I wonder if this isn't an opportunity to turn the tables on the Iranian regime and, and actually kind of be much more actively doing things to destabilize them, given this massive health crisis, given discontent in the population. You know, I mean, isn't it time to, excuse my language, go and fuck them up? <laughs> Is that a policy term? I'm not sure. Um, but let me let me just let me address this. I mean, I think there there are um, there are a lot of people who are making that argument. Um, but what I would say is that uh, first of all, the sanctions that we're putting in place and the diplomatic pressure that we that we maintain on Iran have been consistent and and in, in many cases escalating. We continue to see, to see the Trump administration uh, not only issue new sanctions but also issue new warnings, uh, warning that if Iran trifles with the United States again, that there will be more attacks along the lines of what we saw with Qasem Soleimani, which, by the way, I, I think we have to admit, it was uh, rather devastating uh, for, uh, for the regime when they lost arguably their most powerful general. So I think what we see right now is at least a U.S. strategy that is um, incrementally turning the screws on Iran. Um, now, the question is, what is Iran doing to itself right now? And, and what can we highlight? The fact that it's not handling its COVID crisis properly uh, and that they don't have a handle on, uh, on the pandemic uh, is something that we continue to message and that I think Iran is having a very hard time answering to. Um, the fact that uh, their economy continues to crater uh, and as long as we're able to continue to hold strong on maintaining those sanctions in place and don't provide that sanctions relief that, uh, that some are arguing for. And by the way, they are still able to access the humanitarian channel, which is another argument that we continue to make. Is say, look, they don't need sanctions relief. They can access all the medicine that they need um, and all the medical equipment that they need in order to handle the COVID crisis. They're simply not doing it. So the more we message that, I think uh, the harder it's going to be for this regime to come out intact. And I would just note this, that Iran is not the only regime that is struggling with this right now. There are other uh, malign actors out there in the world that are also trying to deflect and trying to fight off what is a clear attack on their legitimacy and in some cases a self-inflicted attack. And I look at China uh, as a very good example of that as well. The way that they mishandled uh, the initial phases of COVID-19, I think, is really, uh, it's, they're, they're paying a price for it. But I think that really Iran is probably the country that is struggling the most under this Again, as long as we maintain the course under the leadership of the United States, maintaining those sanctions, maintaining the diplomatic pressure, uh, I think you're going to see a steady erosion 
uh, of confidence in the regime. And, and, you know, let's just hope that that leads uh, to a freer Iran one day soon. Uh, next question is for uh, Justice Nigel Rain. Hello. Um, thanks, Dr. Chancer. My question is, what's your assessment of the price of oil on Iran's situation? And a related question to that is, is there any concern in the United States that there might be a more effective attack on Aramco's oil installation in Saudi Arabia than there was in September or October last year? Both, both excellent questions. Um, let, let me just say this. Uh, we are, uh, we've been watching the, uh, the oil markets. It's obviously, it's a fascinating moment and uh, a bit, uh, even a bit scary sometimes uh, for shale producers here in the United States uh, because the price has just cratered so much. This is obviously the result of a price war, a disagreement that, that took place between Russia and Saudi Arabia. And of course, for the Saudis, they see an added benefit here that they are able to basically just uh, crater the, uh, the, the Iranian sales, of course, all of these sales have been illicit, uh, but you know, uh, as they continue to sell to, to countries like Russia or China, uh, the amount of benefit that they get from selling oil at this reduced rate is uh, significantly lowered. And it is just going to be, uh, I, I think, very hard for the Iranians to sustain a budget as long as things are where they are. Now that said, we've seen some indications today, uh, I believe it was this morning here, Washington time, that Donald Trump came out and said that it looked as if there was going to be some kind of a breakthrough for the Russians and the Saudis on the price of oil, that they would come up with some kind of a new arrangement uh, to cooperate, I guess, uh, either within the OPEC or outside of the OPEC structures, and that could actually lead to a rebound, which of course would be bad news for anyone looking to uh, do further economic harm to the regime in Tehran. So we're watching this. I think the Saudis understand that they have drawn, uh, they, they, they've delivered quite a blow, uh, but all the while they're hurting themselves, right? As long as the price of oil stays this low, it's going to hurt the Saudis. I saw today that the, the ratings of uh, the Saudi banking system, as well as the UAE, Oman, I wanna say Bahrain and, and, uh, and maybe Kuwait, all downgraded uh, by the international financial banks. They were all basically saying that this is unsustainable, that their budgets can't last, uh, and that money's gonna get a lot tighter in those countries. So uh, I think they've, they've inflicted some pain on themselves, but also hurt their enemies at, at the same time. So we'll be watching that, uh, but even for the couple of weeks that this has been going on, it has hurt Iran's bottom line. Let's just be very clear about that. Um, it, it was not a mortal blow, but certainly if it continued for another couple of weeks, wow, you can only imagine what it would do. Um, the, uh, the second question, I'm sorry, I, I just forgot the second question. Oh, he's muted. You yeah, would we'll just unmute you there, Nigel. Stand by. Sequence of that, there might be any thinking in Iran that it would be worth attacking again Aramco uh, right, installations. Right. Yeah. Got it. Um, so let me just actually uh, note that the attack on Opcake in, uh, in autumn of, uh, of last year was done through precision munitions. Um, the same kinds of munitions that we're talking about right now that the Iranians are trying to amass, right? When we talk about drones, um, when we talk about cruise missiles uh, or some of these other missiles, right? They are precision in nature. And this is exactly the fear that uh, there could be more attacks on uh, American interests, uh, oil interests around the region. But also don't forget, we have American servicemen that are based uh, in uh, the UAE, in Bahrain, we've got a massive naval base. Uh, we of course have these bases that are uh, scattered across Iraq that we share with the Iraqis and they have been targeted by the Iranians. So, um, this is exactly the concern that we have as long as Iran is able to continue to build these PGMs and they can attack with precision. And we have a, let's just say, a more difficult time encountering them because these precision munitions can sometimes evade our missile defenses. This is exactly the concern that we need to be talking about right now. The PGM issue is Iran's answer to all of this. If they decide that they want to take the war to the West, if they want to take it to the United States or to our allies, 
they are increasingly able to. And right now, the only counter that we see are the Israelis bombing these assets in the middle of the night in places like Syria and Iraq. What we probably should be seeing is sanctions, uh, international sanctions on those involved in the PGM production. Uh, there should be diplomatic pressure on not only Iran, but also Lebanon, Iraq, and maybe even the Assad regime in Syria to the extent that we can even do that anymore. But the idea right now is that, you know, or at least the problem right now is that no one is talking about these precision weapons and Iran believes that it can get away with this. This is why I bring it up and this is why I believe it is likely uh, the most important story uh, after COVID in 2020. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Naomi Levine. Thanks, Joel, and thanks, Jonathan. Um, you haven't sort of directly addressed Hezbollah and particularly Hezbollah's status in Australia. As we know, Hezbollah is sort of Iran's biggest proxy. Um, we know Hezbollah is still uh, not on Australia's terrorist list. Can you give us an update on their activity in, in Australia currently and in the Asia Pacific region more broadly? Sure. Uh, I have to say I'm not, a, uh, I'm not an expert on, on what Australia is doing in your neck of the woods. We know that it is still a political battle um, you know, in, in many countries around the world to have uh, the Iranian uh, terrorist proxies uh, identified as terrorist groups. It really is remarkable. At the United Nations, uh, they have a terrorism list, and their terrorism list are only Sunni jihadist groups. So ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, despite the fact that Iran is, is far more dangerous and Iran's proxies are far more dangerous, better trained, better armed, uh, and, can, and, and, and can inflict far greater harm uh, on the Western world. Uh, the problem, of course, is that you have countries like China and Russia that are defending Iran at the UN. Um, these are, you know, th these are state proxies as opposed to some of these other actors that are non-state actors. Um, but somehow Sunni jihadism has become okay to beat up on, uh, but not the Shia side of the street, so to speak. So uh, this remains a major focus of ours. Um, the UN, obviously, we have a huge problem uh, at the UN. But I think, you know, when you look at countries like Australia, New Zealand, um, the Asia Pacific area, you know, they, they very much adhere to the UN norms. And so our, our sense is that, you know, you're probably not going to get them to budge on this. I know, Colin, this has been something that you've worked on for many, many years, and I wish you a lot of luck with it. But I also know that it is a great challenge. Um, I don't know if folks from AJAC want to mention something about their own efforts. Um, but, you know, the only other thing that I'll just tell you is um, the area that we're watching with regard to Hezbollah um, that we find far more dangerous right now is, uh, is South America. We have seen a huge infiltration of Iran uh, in, uh, in the tri-border area, uh, in Venezuela, uh, Paraguay, Uruguay. I mean, these are countries of weak central authority, which of course Iran loves. This is what they do across the Middle East is they find weak countries and burrow in. They're doing it there and they're actually partnering up with, uh, with narcotics dealers. Uh, and so we have the phenomenon known as narco-terrorism, where the same sort of smuggling routes for weapons and drugs uh, are now you know, uh, being utilized by terrorists as well. Um, and this is one of the ways that Iran and its proxies are able to circumvent US and international sanctions is through the illicit drug trade. And so this is a huge concern for us over there. Uh, you probably have all uh, heard lectures from my colleague, Emanuele Otelenghi. I know he was a lecturer for AJAC uh, some years ago. I think he's been actually even more than once. Emanuele uh, is actually an Italian national, but taught himself Spanish in just a few months and has been spending a, a huge amount of time looking at this problem uh, and actually spending time down there, of course, not lately. Uh, but he has found um, unbelievable networks belonging to Iran that must be disrupted. Okay, I'll hand over to uh, Jamie Himes. Thanks, Joel. Thanks for that, Jonathan. Um, I'm just wondering, at the moment we're hearing a report that Syria is having more success shooting down his railing, 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 railing. And I'm assuming that's with Russian technology. But at the same time, we hear reports that the Russians may not be so keen to allow our to keep its military presence in Syria once the Assad regime has been buttressed. So I'm just wondering if you if you might want to speak briefly about what Russia is likely to do and the effect that might have on Iran being able to continue to spread its tentacles. 
Sure. Uh, you broke up a little bit there, but I think I've got the gist of your, your question. Um, look, uh, first of all, I would say that the Israelis have given me no indication. I don't think they've given anybody any indication uh, that, uh, that uh, the Syrians have been able to target any of their aircraft um, in any serious way. I think there's been one incident uh, where the Israelis had to uh, uh, conduct some kind of an emergency landing or an ejection. Uh, most of the time, it seems as though the Israelis have a complete and total dominance uh, inside Syria. A lot of that has to do with the mechanism that has been set up between Benjamin Netanyahu and uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, now, some people here in the West, those who wish to describe uh, or, or rather to deride the Israelis, will say that uh, the Israelis have become partners or allies with the Russians. I, from what I've un what I've heard and the conversations that I've had with Israelis that have been in the room with Putin, they will say that it's nothing like that at all, that it is really, it's a, it's a professional relationship where the Israelis come in and say, we have a problem, we're going to take care of that problem and we expect you to stand down. Um, and in fact, if anything, what's happened is when the Israelis have gone in and taken out Iranian assets, and again, these are almost always PGMs or parts of PGMs, these precision guided munitions that I talked to you about, that is why the Israelis are bombing Syria. Nine times out of 10, maybe 99 times out of 100, that is what they're looking for. And I think the Russians are now beginning to understand that Iran is something of a liability and that we are, we've actually been seeing indications that Iran uh, and Russia are, all is not well in that alliance. Um, the Russians still wanna support the Assad regime. They wanna be able to show their, um, uh, their other allies around the Middle East that they are, um, that they're loyal, that they have strength, and that their weapons uh, are for sale. Um, that is really the primary goal of Russia being in, in Syria. But also, I think it's important to remember that they just want to stick a finger in the eye of the United States. I mean, we told the world that we were not going to be going into, uh, uh, into Syria after they used chemical weapons. We said it over and over again. Uh, we made it clear that this was not going to be a, a territory that we were going to claim. In the Middle East, we were, said we were tired of Middle East wars, and so Putin said, fine, I'm going in. Um, and he has, and he has shown everybody that he is able to sustain himself there. Now, one last point that I'll just make about the Russian presence. You have this, I mentioned before, this ticking time bomb of COVID in Syria. It is going to be a public health crisis, probably unlike anything that we've seen, uh, the, the amount of, uh, of sick people. Uh, and the way that this pandemic will have gone unchecked. Um, there is a question, quite frankly, about, uh, number one, whether the U.S. is going to be willing to stick it out there, given that there will be a threat uh, uh, in, in terms of public health. But then there's also a question of Russia. And the question, I think, right now is who, is, who, has, who comes up with a strategy for sticking it out? This could be a moment for the United States to try to dislodge the Russians. I'm not going to say that we're willing to do it. If anything, I think right now, the Trump administration's instinct is to get out of the Middle East in any way that it can. And Russia is one of the last remnants where the president has tried to remove our troops time and again. I think that will be his instinct, but I do see this as an opportunity with Russia because, uh, I mean, who wants to stay in a war-torn country that is being overrun by a pandemic that we're uh, you know, still not able to contain? Colin, please. Thanks very much, Joel. Thanks, Jonathan. Just, just to uh, respond to your comment on Hezbollah, yes, it is very anomalous that it's only the so-called external security organization of Hezbollah that's prescribed in Australia, not even its military wing uh, in toto, and certainly not both wings, which are part of the one Hezbollah bird, as, every, as anybody who looks at this issue understands and agrees. So we, we definitely are concerned about this. We think it's against Australia's national interest. There are strong voices calling uh, for further prescription of Hezbollah in, the, in this country. And also to be more circumspect and critical of the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I want to just ask you uh, perhaps a, a simple question here. You, you, you focus on PGMs uh, quite justifiably, a huge concern. But is Iran also using this pandemic as perhaps cover for a fast break or a sprint towards nuclear weapons themselves? 
Look, it's a great question, Colin. Um, uh, look, I would say that, and, you know, speaking to some of my Israeli contacts and, and friends, what they're saying right now is that, uh, again, the IAEA is unable uh, or unwilling to put its uh, inspectors on the ground. They're unable to look at some of the things that have been revealed by the nuclear archive. Uh, but also more importantly, they're, they're not able to see some of the existing structures that were allowed to remain uh, in Iran pursuant to the nuclear deal. These are places where Iran was purportedly going to be just conducting some research. Um, of course, we know that Iran has already uh, pushed on some of the limits of enrichment and, and in other areas, uh, which have been cause for alarm in Israel. Um, and in the United States, but it's, I would say that it's far worse right now, given that uh, everyone's attention is turned elsewhere. Uh, and I believe the Iranians understand that they have uh, potentially an opportunity. So, uh, you know, I think there are probably Israelis that are watching this uh, very closely. Hopefully the U.S. and other Western countries are trying to do their best. But again, uh, you know, COVID seems to have uh, just thrown everybody for a loop everybody's uh, you know, sheltering in place, they've gone back to Vienna, uh, or they're staying in their hotel rooms in, in Tehran, uh, waiting for this thing to pass. And all the while, you know, as long as the Iranians don't mind getting uh, a little sick here and there, maybe losing a few lives here and there, they, can, they certainly have an opportunity to try to push the envelope on the nuclear program. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much for that. We'll uh, leave it there as we're ticking to the hour mark. And it's my pleasure to hand over to Jeremy Jones uh, to present the vote of thanks. Thank you. This is not strictly a vote of thanks. It's a thank you first to the members of parliament who were part of the, today's program. We all have opinions about what should be done, but you have responsibilities. And we're very grateful for the effort being put in by policymakers to try and protect us all here and get us through a very difficult time. I'd then like to thank those who put this together, Ariel, Joel and Naomi. It's great that we are able to have a session like this and to thank everybody who's taken part today, uh, audio, video, asking questions so that we've been able to have the benefit of Jonathan Chanza addressing what we wanted to hear as well as telling us things that we don't want to hear because of what, of the policy implications. But I'd just particularly like to thank Jonathan Chanza. For those who don't follow Jonathan Chanza's Twitter feed, you should. You will not only be enlightened, but you'll also be entertained. For those who don't follow the work of the FPD, do yourself a favour, subscribe to it. You will get a great deal of information about things obviously of interest to you if you've been part of this webinar. And the same goes with the Australia Israel Jewish Affairs Council. We have been putting out a great deal of useful material on a range of subjects. We have a Twitter feed, our Facebook page, uh, bulletins we distribute, a blog. Please take advantage of that material. We publish it so that you can be better informed in the decisions you are making. And again, I'd particularly like to thank, to thank Jonathan Janza for taking the time to be with us, to share his expertise with us, to share his opinions with us, and to give us a great deal of insight into matters of great concern to us. So thank you very much, Jonathan Chanza. And I'd like to wish everybody on this conference also Kasher Vesameh Pesach. And I'd also like to wish those who are observing a holy and meaningful Easter. Uh, we look forward to you all being with us after the conclusion of Pesach and Easter when we will have the next in our series. Thank you all and have a good weekend.